Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. If you're just joining us today for the first time, we've been in a series called Rut to Revival. And today I wanna begin to talk about revival life. And so we, if you have your Bibles, we'll have on the screen, you wanna turn to John chapter 15. And I wanna begin tackling questions about revival, questions like what is revival? Where does revival come from? What is the source? How does revival manifest and come about or grow? What are the signs and fruit of revival? And and how do we cultivate, feed, and water revival? And just so you know, next week is uh, Pentecost Sunday, where churches remember how the Holy Spirit came upon the church in Acts 2. And we'll have prayer night next next Sunday night. So plan to come back for prayer at 6 o'clock. We're believing for the the uh, revival spirit to move through our church even more and to fill us and baptize us next week and, and starting this week as well. What is revival? What is revival? Well, revival is salvations. Revival is water baptisms. Revival is spirit baptisms, being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Um, revival is, is consistent obedience sanctified, transformed, godly living. Did you know that's revival? Consistently living the way God has asked us to live. Pastor Kuhn touched on that very well last week. Spirit-led and a spirit-filled church, a church that is led by the Spirit and filled with the Holy Spirit is revival. A church making disciples and evangelizing the lost. A praying church, that's revival. A church that that has faith in action. They don't just believe that God can do something. They step out and start doing something because God said he would do it. That's revival. A church that has signs and miracles and spiritual gifts in action. We're seeing healings happening in this church. We're seeing miracles of provision happening in this church. But does this all happen once, uh, uh, overnight, uh, all at once and overnight? No. No. And can this kind of life be sustained, this revival life? Absolutely. So where does revival begin? You know, the the image of revivals that we all have is probably those big tents, right? And the big crusades, right? Where the altars are flooded and and maybe, maybe you've heard of revivals and so you travel to those places where revival is happening. I've heard of people flying to them just to be a part of the revival, people being healed, and and again, salvations and baptisms, these are all signs and works and powerful signs of God working, and we are currently seeing this happening at Calvary right now. Praise the Lord for that. God is moving. Those images and perspectives of revival are catalysts that have indeed started movements like the Assemblies of God Fellowship. Our church is part of the Assemblies of God Fellowship. And it was because of revival in, on, on Azusa Street in California that a revival of, of a fellowship of the Assemblies of God swept across the land and now around the world. So we need those important moments that we hear about and have seen over time. We probably get a little scared too of revival, if we're honest. Because our idea and picture of revival is is that we're going to have to be at church for like four weeks in a row every night. I know us pastors, we're a little scared of that, right? When are we going to sleep, you know? When are we going to get other things done? But I don't think we have to be afraid of that. I think what happens is when you start to experience revival, you want that, right? You want that. But let it be known right now that that is actually still not exactly how revival works because that's not how revival worked in the first church in Acts. They went out and now started making disciples from town to town, home to home, village to village. They didn't always stay at the temple. They had to go and they lived and they had work and they had to go to their jobs and provide for their families. That is still revival. You can live in revival life that's not at the church all the time, just so you know. 
Is there catalyst movements? Is there revival movements like that? Again, yes. But it's meant to get us out there into the world to reach the lost and to walk in revival every day. Many have chased down revivals and have powerful testimonies. But the reality is those revivals seem to end because we didn't know how to maintain them or carry them on. Think about that for a moment. We go to the revival. I've heard of people flying down to Brownsville to get a a taste and experience of the revival, and they did, but they did not know how to maintain it because they didn't have a revival life at home. What I believe God has given me for today and for our church is that we must live revival life so that those moments come about and then can be maintained and be a lifestyle of the church of Jesus Christ. If you want to see a lifestyle of revival, turn no more or no further than to Acts, chap- or Acts really one through the whole book. <laughs> Read the whole book. It's the reason why it's called Acts of the Apostles because it was, or Acts of the Spirit through the Apostles. That's why it's called that because it was the Spirit of God working through the Apostles and the church. And it was the action of the Holy Spirit working and they just could not stop moving across the land and reaching souls. So where does revival begin? It's not as big and as charismatic and eventful as you think. It's not. Just so you know. Those might be amazing moments. Again. But revival begins in a subtle but powerful place. Revival is where the believer, the disciple, is devoted to remain connected dependent and obedient to Christ. So there it is. The revival begins with Jesus. Revival begins with our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's look at scripture though to see what I mean, to see what God means. So we're going to be in John chapter 15 today. Verse 1. I am the true grapevine, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples, and and the Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. What does that mean? They are already saved and sanctified by the message, the gospel message that Jesus has given them. They have believed and accepted it. They are saved and they are sanctified by what Jesus has taught them and has said to them. So the disciples are saved here. They're believers. He says this then, remain in me. Since you are a believer, remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit If it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you... You may ask for anything you want, and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. Verse 9 says, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. Just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves or servants in other translations because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything the father told me. You didn't choose me, I chose you. I appoint you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command, 
love each other. It's fascinating when he says, you didn't choose me, I chose you. Historically, the Pharisees were not the ones who would go and pick who were their followers. The followers had to pick who they were going to follow. So the followers, the disciples would pick the Pharisees and they would pick which, which influence they want to follow. The difference with Christ is he picked the people and he picked people you would never expect. And he appointed them to do good works. He appointed them to be fruitful. He appointed them to glorify his name and to be witnesses and to build the church. He appointed people you would never expect. He chose them. Wow. Just as branches are dependent on the vine for their life supply, so Christians need Christ's life-giving flow to enable them to bear spiritual fruit in their lives. I want you to think about this for a moment. The grapevine is Jesus, and he has one job, and that's to feed the branches, which is us. So either something's wrong with Jesus, which we know that's not the case, or something's wrong with the branches if they're not growing fruit. It's a little convicting, isn't it? It's a little correcting, isn't it? That if we're not growing, if the disciples weren't gonna grow, if they weren't gonna bear Christ-like qualities and they weren't going to start living like Jesus, it wasn't Jesus' fault, it was their fault. And it's my fault if I'm not growing. It's my fault if I'm not seeing revival rise up in my life because he says, you've saved, you're sanctified, you've been purified by my word. Now remain in me. If we remain in Christ, we will bear fruit and depending on the translation you use, more fruit, secondly, and lastly, lasting fruit or much fruit. You know what that sounds like? That sounds like revival life to me. That's ever increasing measure of more and more fruit to do things for the Lord, to do good things for God, to do his work. So the key words in here is remain in me. Well, how do we do that? Well, it starts with, how did you start your relationship with Jesus? It was by faith. It was by faith. You believed in Christ. You became a believer. You became a Christian. And so we remain in Christ by having enduring faith through every circumstance, even when he disciplines us and prunes us, okay? It says that he cuts branches that are dead, but he also prunes and cuts back the ones who are actually growing. So there will be times where he, he tests us and he puts us through trials. He allows us to be cut back and humbled so that we would grow even more. You know, you might be really good at being kind, but you might need to grow in your patience, right? And so he, he trims back your life so you would, he would put you through some experiences where your patience is tested, okay? Or he puts you through some times where you need to step out in faith and trust God that he's going to provide. And so he puts us through those moments to grow us in our trust, this is how he develops as he prunes at times. I, I could preach on this scripture for weeks and weeks and weeks. There's so many great applications. How do we remain? Again, by faith. We remain through fellowship. By praying and being with him in the word and letting his word help us and teach us and guide us. We remain in him as we see in scripture, by obeying his commands. See, it says if we love him, we will obey him. So it's loving obedience, not duty, or I'm supposed to obey just because the Bible says so. No, you fall so in love with him that you obey his word, you obey his commands. That is, that is how you remain in him. So we have faith and enduring faith, and loving obedience and fellowship. And the result is we become more and more like Christ. And we also see fruit in this scripture as well. Here's some of the fruit that is mentioned in the scripture. Uh, answered prayers. That if you, if you remain in me, anything you ask in my name will be given to you. Do you know what happens there? 
the more we remain in him, the more we let his word teach and speak to us and minister to us, the more we're gonna ask the right prayers or pray the right prayers. Because now our hearts and desires line up with the word of God. Now, I'm gonna tell you a quick story real fast. I didn't, didn't plan on doing this, but I just feel like I should. Um, our fire pit burned out on the bottom. So we, you know, we have a, a concrete pad we wanted to have a fire pit on. Um, and so I didn't wanna spend the money for a new fire pit. And my mom sends me these, these new solo stoves. Have you seen those? I guess not, okay. <laughs> it's basically an odorless fire pit. You can pick it up, take it camping anywhere you want. Wish I had that back in youth group when I went to, to do things with the youth. But anyway, she's like, hey, they're on sale. Why don't you pick one up? I'm like, well, yeah, mom, thanks. But that's a couple hundred bucks I don't have. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass on that. And so I prayed that day. And I said, Lord, if you, if you would like for us to have this, I feel like more of a luxury than a need, but if you would like for us to have this, either you will send the money or you will actually send a fire pit. <laughs> and I just let it go. I said, hey, Lord, you can do that. Now, I don't think that's like a pressing prayer need on my list, but I thought, you know, we love to have people over, we love to entertain, and we use the fire pit every time for the glory of God. So I'm going to pray that. I get a call a week later from a friend who says, hey, I was doing a product review for a business. And uh, they sent me a gift and it has their logo on it and I don't really want it. It's a solo stove. <laughs> Would you like it? I think God just did that to show off. And now we have this, that, guess what? It's also the one I wanted. It was the one I wanted. I was like, after I told that story to my brother-in-laws, because I was loving on them and ministering to them last weekend while my dad was preaching and in town, um, my brother-in-law joked and said, hey, I got a prayer list. I need you to start praying about, you know. <laughs> answered prayers. Of course, I like the prayers that are answered when uh, my wife is healed. Praise the Lord, my wife was healed recently. Thank the Lord. Uh, we, we see that fruit is, from Galatians 5, 22 through 23, we see that fruit is obviously the fruit of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, all those things. Uh, we see in this scripture, though, that we grow in love for one another. According to John 15, we will love one another. And there will be a unity with one another. And by the way, love for one another is a key demonstration of revival, but also a key ingredient to revival spreading. That's why I believe love is key in this scripture and in revival. Uh, we see in this scripture overflowing joy. Overflowing joy. How many want to be just so happy, so full of joy that no matter what's going on in the world, you're still happy? Amen. Amen. Ryan, why are you still smiling? Have you seen the world? Because I have hope and joy from the Lord. It's not that I'm not mourning, I'm not sad for what's happening, but I have to maintain, I have to continue to follow Jesus and he gives me joy to get through these times. I can't help it, he just does. It says in this scripture that we grow, here's another fruit, we grow in love and loyalty and obedience to God and his word. Pastor Kuhn showed us last week that the danger of, of, of the danger of disobedience and now we're learning the reason for obedience is fruitfulness. So it's dangerous to not obey and remain because then we wither up and then we're, we're cut off from God and burned in a fire. Again, like I said, I could spend a lot of weeks teaching on that, on this scripture. Or we can obey God, remain in him, and we can thrive and other people benefit from our fruitfulness. But most of all, we see another sign of fruit is God gets the glory. That we will be true disciples according to verse 8 and 9. We are true disciples who bring glory to God through our witness to the world. This is the fruit of remaining in Christ. And this all happens not at a church event, not at a revival. It can happen in your own home. 
You see, we went to revivals not ready to handle revival life. We didn't have a, a lifestyle of being fed by Jesus Christ. See, revival is not at an event. It's not from a pastor. It's from Jesus Christ. Jesus is revival. Jesus is the source of revival. The word says here, apart from Christ, we can't be or do anything that he has called and planned for us as his disciples. And how can you tell someone is hungry for revival? They hang out with Jesus. They remain in him by faith through all circumstances. They have faith. They obey him. They love him and they love others. You see, we kind of reveal what we really want. If we want revival, we remain in Christ. If we want to just be mediocre or stay in ruts, we don't get with Christ. We don't follow him. But true disciples do. And I'm calling us to be a church of true disciples and I will never apologize for that. Because I know that the true disciples in the Bible turn the world upside down. And Jesus chose people that, uh, well, just like us. So we can do it too. Right here in Delaware, our first state revival. Okay. So the result of, grow of growth, the result of remaining in Christ is increasing measures of bearing fruit, more fruit, and much or lasting fruit. Um, I want to encourage you with this. Uh, God gave me this little note. Sometimes God gives me little devotional notes for myself and also for the church. And I think this is for people here today. Um, I don't have anyone in particular, but I want to get this out. Fellowship and abiding in the vine, which is Jesus, is not a waste of time. It's not a waste of time. And don't confuse a waiting season for a rut. It's okay to wait in the Lord and wait and wait and just be in the vine like a branch. Just stay in the vine and be fed during a season where you need to be fed. That's not a rut as long as you're waiting productively. What do I mean by that? Well, I thought about this as God gave me this this week. I thought about when Moses went up to the mountain with God to get the commandments and he was up there for around 40 days and the people, they started living a hot mess down there in the bottom of the mountain. All they needed to do was wait for Moses to come back and instead they started making calves, golden calves and worshiping it and it wasn't good and God had to punish that. What I'm saying is if you're gonna be in a waiting season, wait well. Wait productively. Hang out with Jesus. And by the way, if you do that, you're going to have to start doing what he says, which means you're not going to be waiting that much longer and you're going to start doing God's will. Because I can't hang out with Jesus and not obey his word. Jesus moves in me to go and do. Praise the Lord. I just want, I want, this is so key. This is, a, this is why revival moves across lands and, and in people's lives. Because when you get with Jesus and you let his word and his spirit minister, you're gonna want to go do something. It's not gonna be that you're forcing yourself to share Jesus with the world. You won't be able to keep him in. He's gonna be fruit just growing out of you. You're gonna, I mean, I can walk around looking like I got grapes all over you, but you're gonna, you're gonna walk around looking like Jesus and you're not gonna be able to help it, but tell people about Jesus. Look, I'm getting so excited, I'm about to knock my binder off. Ryan, I don't, I don't feel like evangelizing. I don't feel like helping people. I, maybe you haven't. Guess what? It means you need to get connected to the one who does, and that's Jesus. <laughs> Fellowship in the vine is not a waste of time. Now pay attention, though, because if you're going to hang out with Jesus, and maybe you're in a season where you're not serving anymore, maybe you've taken a break from that kind of thing, be careful, be careful, because you can't stay there too long if you're going to obey the word. There's too many people dying and going to hell without Jesus right now. There's too many, there's too many young men. There's too many young men who are alone, who are loners, whose parents are not present in his life. And he needed a mentor. And instead he went out and bought a gun. 
That's, the, that's why we need revival in our nation. See, no one wants to talk about that. No one wants to talk about that there was no one in his life to be there for him. And that's the role of the church. We're supposed to be there for the fatherless. We're supposed to be there for the widows. That gets me fired up. That's why we're doing this next gen week. We as a church are going to rise up and be there for the next generation so stuff like that doesn't happen. Because love would capture that man's heart. And he would have never done anything like that. The love of God. That's the real problem. And love conquers evil. I'm not trying to get political here, but just you got to look at the Old Testament and the New Testament. Laws did not fix mankind. That's why God sent Jesus. We're talking theology here. We're talking theology here. We're talking God-centered theology here. It, the laws just told us that we were wrong or it told us the punishment of how long we were going to be punished. It never fixed the people's hearts. That's why Jesus had to die to fix our hearts. That must be the first step and then we can start dealing with all the others. But this country has kicked God out. But at the same time, we have the freedom in this country to be like Christ. No one's telling us we can't be like Jesus. We as a church need to step up and start doing something. We need to do something. Man, that wasn't even in my notes. All right. So a friendly reminder, we can't produce spiritual fruit because we're not the Holy Spirit. Just so you know, that's an important point. The fruit of the Spirit only comes from the Spirit or Jesus Christ, the vine. But what we can do is cooperate with Christ and the Spirit through abiding, pruning, and practicing the fruit that is growing in us because we are remaining in him. In other words, like I said earlier, you can wait, but you can't wait too long. You can, and by the way, we wait and do at the same time as believers. Where, where, where'd you get that from? Jesus. He always got a way to be with the Father. Before he fed the 5,000, he was up on the mountaintop having experience with God, praying to his Father, and he came down and started doing things. Your waiting is meant to turn into doing, just so you know. So how do we cultivate in water revival? Do you know that you can help revival grow? You can't cause it. You can't, you can't um, make fruit grow out of you. It's not you. It's the work of Jesus as you stay in him and as you remain in him. But the Bible says to be holy and live godly lives. I want to go into some yard illustrations real quick, okay, since it's summertime, springtime still. All right, but let me give you some scripture first. Titus 2, 11. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. Talking about Jesus. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness. So to be pure and holy, there's holiness right there, and worldly passions. So it teaches us to say no to ungodliness or holiness and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to do while we wait for Jesus to come back to appear as our blessed hope? We are supposed to be pure, but also be godly, which means to, to live out the fruit of Christ. Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, kindness, love, all those things, okay? And verse 14 says, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, ready for this, eager to do what is good. Hey, Ryan, I'm not really feeling motivated to do good things and help and do, because you need to get in the vine, you need to remain in him and let him feed you those desires. You cannot create those desires. The spirit of God gives you those desires. That's Philippians 2.13. Okay, so how do we cultivate that? Jerry Bridges in his book, Growing Your Faith, says this. The pursuit of holiness 
is to focus on separating ourselves from sin by mortifying the expressions of sin in our lives. The godly person certainly does this, but he does more than mortify sin. The godly person seeks to put on those positive virtues of Christ-like character, which Paul calls the fruit of the spirit, and which he elsewhere urges us to clothe ourselves with them. Therefore, holiness is to take off or put to death sinful things. Didn't Pastor Kuhn do a good job of talking about that last week? Okay. So holiness is to take off and put to death those things. Godliness is to put on Christ-like character. We can't, we can't even have Christ-like character if we're not in relationship with Jesus and remaining in him and living in him. So before I continue, remember that spiritual fruit doesn't grow unless we live in Christ by faith and loving obedience. So let me share with you an illustration. At my old house, we had grass that was very sparse, um, just too much room for weeds, and we had bare spots, and my neighbor was a landscaper. Yeah. And I wasn't. I'm a pastor who's kind of busy. And uh, so he said, hey, and he was really cool. He, was, he, was, he helped a lot. He was really cool. He said, hey, just want to let you know, like, one of the best ways to keep weeds from growing, just in case I double checked with Johnny Nichols Landscaping, just so you know. <laughs> the best way to keep weeds out of your yard is to plant more seeds of grass. Huh. Huh. Now, now, I think he was talking after that, but my mind went to a sermon. I was like, huh. So the Christian life isn't just weeding our lives from sin, okay? But the Christian life is to also plant good things in our lives, to fill the void so that there's no room for the weeds or sin to take root and grow. See, too many times you've been raised in church or in a home that said, don't sin, don't sin, don't sin. Great. But what do I do? Godliness. And you can't get it without Christ. You can't experience new life, revival life without being plugged in to Jesus Christ. You see, we are supposed to be holy, but we're also supposed to be godly and do good things for the, for the work of the Lord and the kingdom of God. And we can only do that, we can only start doing good things if we have good in us, and that's Jesus Christ. You see, that's where revival begins, church. And, and now you have a healthy lawn, but you also really have a healthy life. Okay, so everyone's going home. It's a little, it's a bad season to do it. I had to plant new seed recently and I've been watering that thing every day and believe it or not, grass came out. And as I'm watering, it just, it just started growing, right? And as I'm watering, I'm like, wow, imagine what can happen in a church if we tend to that. Imagine if we keep sowing seeds of Jesus Christ and we keep watering it and we go with the flow of what the Holy Spirit's doing in our lives and we do the good that he's putting in us. Can you imagine what's gonna take place in our lives and the people around us? It's called revival is gonna take place. Revival. As we remain in the vine, the nature of Christ, the characteristics and fruit of the spirit grow. When we do what God's word says, we go with the flow of revival life moving and working in us. Godly desires and godly living increase and worldly desires and worldly living no longer thrive or have room in our lives. By the way, these notes are online, calvarydover.org, if you want to read them. So what am I talking about here? I'm talking about revival. And I want you to know there's two kinds of revival. There's personal revival and there's corporate or church revival. So personal revival begins with a single person like you or I being saved and transformed by Christ. Personal revival is when you hunger and thirst for more of God and you want others to know God. Think about that for a moment. You can tell when you're in revival because you're hungry for more of God, but not 
that you just want God, but you want other people to experience what you're experiencing. Is that how you've been feeling? Think about that for a moment as I keep reading characteristics of personal revival. Personal revival is living by faith, being led by the Spirit, praying and seeing prayers answered. Personal revival is when the believer is walking in obedience, overflowing with the fruit of Christ, sharing the good news of Jesus to the lost and making disciples. Personal revival is operating your spiritual gifts with demonstrations of the Spirit's power and work through you. When this grows and becomes your life, and it can, just so you know, but you got to start in the right place, okay, in that secret place with Jesus in the vine. When this starts to happen, you know that the Holy Spirit is on fire inside of you. Revival is burning in you so much. And I already said it earlier, you don't know what to do with it. You only have two outlets. Worship God in every way you can, not just singing, but worship God in serving and giving and making disciples. And the other one is you can't help but tell people about Jesus. That's when you know you're in personal revival. Do you want to know when a church is in revival? When everyone starts having the same thing happen in their lives. You see, the church doesn't get in revival because the pastor is in revival. The church is in revival because we all live in personal revival. I can't get you to be in revival. I can't. Jesus has to give you revival. And when we all start living in revival, this church, we will need, a, we will need more space. We will need to plant. We will need to start new churches. There will be a revival here. But personal revival first so that we can handle a church revival. Let me close with this. I've been living in revival. I just want you to know. And I don't say this to be bragging. I don't say that. I just want to give you an example. I've been living in revival. God captured my heart years ago. And I love him so much. I want to do whatever he says to do. Does it ebb and flow? Yeah. Yeah. Does it need to grow at times? Yes. Sometimes it's like, woo, you know, like a roller coaster. But I'm living in revival. Since Jesus saved my life, I've been trying to grow and be in, in fellowship with Christ, and I've been doing what he says to do. I've been living in revival. Church, you can live in revival. All these things that I have defined, you can live in it. I can't, this is, this, is, this is the Holy Spirit coming out today. Every time I'm up here, it's the Holy Spirit just exuding himself out to, to minister. This isn't me. This isn't my doing or my power. This is Jesus. And it starts with my alone time with him and letting him feed me every day so that I don't dry up and wither and I'm useless in his kingdom. I don't want to be like that. You can have revival. If you've been living this way, keep going. And if, and if you need to start, I want to encourage you to start at the right place. It's not, it's not me. It's not some event you're going to fly to. It's right there with Jesus because he is revival. He revived your life at salvation. He'll continue to feed your life everything you need. You will be very fruitful. Amen. Let me stand together so we can pray. The verse that came to my mind as I was writing about my testimony was, it is no longer I who live, but Christ in me. Christ who lives in me. You know, that's revival. When you're like, man, I would never be like this. You're right, because that's Christ inside of you working. That's why. That's why. I want that for this church and for our nation. Our nation needs Jesus. I hope you heard my heart earlier about that, that young man. Because his heart needs to change first before we do anything else. And it didn't. And we need to continue to move in, in a nation where we as the church, we... We help people encounter Christ so they can have a heart change. And they'll want to obey the laws. They'll want to serve God too. Amen? Let's pray. God, 
we thank you for your word today. Lord, revival is in you, and then it's in us, and then it's in this church, and in this community, and in our nation. God, forgive us if we have not been yielding to the vine. Forgive us if we have not been branches who are connected and remain connected by faith and loving obedience. Lord, help us. Lord, feed us. May we go out and live what you've been teaching us, Lord. May we step out in faith. When you ask us to do the hard things, that's to remain in you. It's to walk by faith, not by sight. Lord, help us as a church to be that. Lord, I pray for personal revival to take place in our people. And then when a group or a church, large or small, comes together, that is a church revival in action. Lord, we pray for that here, God. And Lord, help us to live this message out today. God, again, we cry out that you would move across this nation and in every church, wake us up, God. God, revive us, revive our lives, revive us, Lord, to obey, to go and minister to these young men and women who need Jesus. God, help us, use us, Lord. Show us who we can minister to, Lord. Lead us. God, We give you our worship, Lord. We give you our tithes and offerings as we leave today or online. God, we give you our actions today as we go into restaurants, into our homes. Lord, may we shine Jesus everywhere we go. We thank you, Lord, for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen.